welcome to my photography masterclass. My name is Terry White, Worldwide Photography at Vanville's here at Adobe. It's my pleasure to be streaming to you once again on Masterclass Friday here on Adobe Live. Uh, I want to thank everyone who's watching from all the different places you might be watching from. If you're watching this on Twitter, if you're watching this on Facebook, if you're watching this on YouTube, that's awesome. But if you want me to see your questions, if you want me to see your comments, head over to b.net slash, uh, slash Adobe Live. And that's where, um, that's the one chat that I'll be able to pay attention to for the rest of the stream. All right, uh, oh, yep, wrong mic, sorry. <laughs> How about that? Is that better? Okay, sorry about that. And uh, if, I, if I was on the pre-stream and you didn't hear this, uh, hear me as well, it's because I hadn't moved my mic over. So once again, uh, welcome. My name is Terry White, Worldwide Photography Evangelist. Um, here on uh, Adobe Live. And again, if you are watching this uh, on another platform, head over to b.net slash Adobe Live and uh, you'll be able to, um, uh, I'll be able to see your comments and just like the people that were saying, hey, you were on the wrong mic because I hadn't moved this one over yet. Yeah, that was it. Okay, so with that said, thanks everyone for joining me and thanks for the mic tip. I you know, wouldn't want to be silent or very quiet throughout the rest of the stream, but uh, we are here. All right, so today we're going to be taking a look at Photoshop tips and tricks for uh, photographers. The, um, <laughs> the power of mic placement. Uh, the Photoshop tips and tricks for photographers and... Um, just, uh, we're going to start actually with one of the things I left off of last week. I promised I would show it this week and I left off last week and I didn't show it. So I'm going to show this one Lightroom thing and then the rest of the hour is going to be all Photoshop. All right. With that said, um, thanks for joining me and let's go ahead and dive right in now that we have the mic in the right spot. All right. Let's switch over to my desktop. I've got my desktop up now. We're going to go ahead and I'm in Photoshop. I'm going to switch back to Lightroom just for a second. Because again, I promised a Lightroom uh, trick for, uh, or actually I left off last week without showing this one thing. And this one thing we were talking about last week, how to start your Lightroom year off right. And um, one of the ways to do that is to move photos that are in Lightroom that are like maybe you did a project, you did a shoot, you edited it, you distributed it, you, get, you, you did everything you need to do with those photos, but they're sitting on your main hard drive and you just don't need them on your main hard drive anymore because you're done with them. Like you, you don't wanna throw them away, but you're, they're taking up space on the primary drive and maybe you wanna move them to a, a, a NAS or a network drive or a backup drive, or not a backup drive, but an external drive. So here I've got a external drive, uh, this is a Western Digital. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just plug it in, and when I plug this drive in, we're going to see something amazing happen. All right, it's lighting up. I know it's plugged in, and the amazing thing that happens is, that's a joke, nothing happens because Lightroom doesn't care that you plug the drive in unless you've used that drive before. It doesn't know that that drive is for Lightroom. In other words, it's not gonna waste time looking at drives that you plug in, unplug day in and day out that you've not ever, not ever used with Lightroom. Why would it waste its time looking at that external drive? So, but if I go to my uh, operating system here, let me just bring up a finder window. If I bring up a finder window, there it is, new external hard drive, it is right there. So on this new external hard drive, now you would, buy your drive, you would format it for your platform, you would do everything to get that drive ready. But the one thing you probably want to do on that drive as well is put a folder on it for all these images that you're going to move to it from your main drive. So I'm going to create a new folder on this new external hard drive. And this new folder is going to be called, um, let's just give it a nice name, pictures from the past. Okay. So that way we know it's not the main pictures folder. It's the pictures from the past folder, pictures we've used before, pictures we're done with. We don't want to say archive. We don't want to say anything like that because we may still use them. We just don't need them on the main drive. All right. So now external drives all set up. It's formatted. It's plugged in. It's got the new folder on it, but Lightroom doesn't know anything about it. What I need to do is I need to add that drive to Lightroom. So Lightroom does know about it. And the way you add a drive to Lightroom is actually in, in Lightroom Classic we're talking about, sorry, Lightroom Classic. 
is you do it in the folders panel. In the folders panel, you click the plus sign and you add a folder. And it will come up and ask you, add a folder where? Which folder do you want to add? And that's where you go navigate to that new external hard drive. And we've already, we've already created the folder. If you hadn't, you could create the folder right now. But we've already created the folder. This is the folder we want. So I just open it. It's empty. And we're just going to choose it. Now, once I do that, look at what happens in the folders panel. It comes up and says, oh, you've added a drive to Lightroom that it will now keep track of from here on out called new external hard drive. And if I twirl that down, there's one folder on it called pictures from the past. Now, you might remember, hey, Jason Levine, what's going on, buddy? Uh, and Jason, by the way, is going to be doing his masterclass later today on something audio and video. I haven't looked at his topic yet, but I'm sure it's going to be something cool on audio slash video. All right. With that said, um, it, I've, I've opened that folder. And by the way, when I twirl that drive down, you'll notice that it just simply says uh, pictures from the past because that's the folder we added just now. But if we go back to that drive, there was another folder on there called Other. Again, Lightroom only pays attention to what you tell it to pay attention to. So we told it to pay attention to that one folder, Pictures from the Past, and that's the only folder it cares about on that drive. So that means that you could put other things on that drive, but Lightroom's only going to care about that one folder. Now that you got that all set up, that's all you need to do to move images from one drive, like my internal laptop drive or my internal um, uh, desktop drive, that I want to now clear some space and move those photos to the other drive. All I have to do now is go get those other photos, which I had. Here we go. I was I was I have 248 raw files from um, uh, an, Atlanta, an Atlanta shoot I did just around town, July, 2019, back when you could be around town and around people and all that. So just, uh, just shooting around the city in 2019, I don't need those photos on my main drive anymore. So I'm just going to take that whole folder, Atlanta, July, 2019 summer and drag it to the pictures from the past folder and let go. And this is the most important part of this process is happening up here in the background right now. It's not copying those images, it's moving them. So once this progress bar is finished, it will have moved that entire folder, all the images and videos and whatever's in it, all the retouches, all the data, everything that's in it to the new, to the new external drive. Now, that also means that I need to now be responsible for backing up that external drive because those are that's the only place those images will be uh, because they're not on the internal drive anymore. And if I don't back up that external drive and something happens to that external drive or the external drive gets lost or gets damaged or just gets corrupted or whatever, then those images are gone for good. So keep in mind when you're using Lightroom Classic, you're responsible for all your images no matter where you put them. Now, you might just say, well, Terry, couldn't you have plugged the external drive in, used the operating system, and just copied the images over to it, and then deleted them from the old place? Yes. But then Lightroom wouldn't know about it. You would have to come back to Lightroom and tell Lightroom, hey, I've now moved this folder to this drive, and you'd have to reconnect it. Not a big deal, but it's just so much easier to let Lightroom do the whole thing in one step. And I don't care. It's just going at the, you know, in the background. I can keep working. I don't have to do anything else. But once it's finished, Lightroom will now know that they're on that drive. It won't ask me any questions. There won't be any missing folder or missing image icons. All the data will be there. All the edits will be there. Everything will be there from one folder to the next. And more importantly, those 248 raw files or whatever they were will not be taking up space on my internal drive anymore. That's it. And I could have selected more than one folder. You don't have to do one at a time. You can select 10 folders at a time, move them all to the external drive or the NAS or the other um, network storage or whatever you want. And now this is a question that come up last week as well. I didn't get a chance to answer it. Um, network drives. So I indicated that it could have been a NAS. Yes, your images can be on a network drive, but your catalog should not be on a network drive. So does that make sense? Your catalog should always be on a physical drive connected to your computer. 
the images themselves can be on a physical drive connected to your computer in your internal drive or um, on a NAS so, or, or network drive. So um, that's it. That was the tip that I did not have time to finish last week. We don't have to sit here and wait for that to finish. We'll check back in on it later. But that's just now moving. And you can even see it, uh, the number go down on this drive. Uh, they're going down 151, 150. It's moving those images one by one over. And you can see the number go up on the new drive, 101, 102. So it's moving them one by one. And once they're all there, they'll all be there and not taking up space on this drive anymore. All right, that's it. That was the Lightroom tip left over from last week. Now let's go ahead and dive into um, some Photoshop. All right, let me bring up my Photoshop notes of what I wanted to cover. There we are. Okay, let's uh, pop over to Photoshop. And in this, um, I got this one image open. I'm not ready to do this one tip yet, just yet. But let's go ahead and pop over to, um, to my Adobe Live library. There we are. And um, I just want to point out, I've shown this particular image before. I think I have. Let me just drill down to a background first. Dun, 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 dun. There it is. There's a the background I want. I've shown this tip before uh, with this actual, this actual image before. But when I showed it last time, uh, Photoshop had not had the update that it just, re just recently got. So I'm going to drag this image over one more time. So... Uh, so by the way, so we're switching gears now. We just got out of Lightroom. We just did the last thing. And now um, we're switching to Photoshop tips for photographers. So really what I'm showing you for photographers that just say, hey, I just use Lightroom. I don't even know why I would ever use Photoshop. What's Photoshop going to do for me that I can't do in Lightroom? That's what the rest of this time is about. All the stuff I can do in Photoshop that I couldn't even begin to, to do in Lightroom. I just did one of those things. I opened up an image, I drug another image on top of it. So I'm now compositing, which I would not be able to do in Lightroom. I can't combine multiple images together on top of each other, unless I go to the book module, but then I wouldn't even be able to cut them out or anything. So there's one layer on bottom, that's the cityscape, and then the layer on top. Now again, I've shown this exact model from Adobe Stock before, and I've shown uh, that background before. But what's new? is uh, obviously I'm gonna cut out the background, this teal color. What's new in this particular uh, instance is that when I go to select subject, which is where I would always start with something like this, select subject's been enhanced uh, over the last year to now pay attention to hair and pay attention to portraits. Normally you would do all of that work in select and mask and you still can. You will still go in there to do, to do the final processes, but Instead of doing 80 to 90% of the work in Select and Mask for the hair, Select Subject is going to do 80 and 90% of the work selecting it right in the first place. That's the big difference. And there's also even a newer nuance to Select Subject, or I'm sorry, Select and Mask, uh, that we're going to get into. So there's no, there's no dialog box. There's nothing you have to tell it to do. You just simply say Select Subject, and it looks at your image, and Adobe Sensei figures out what the subject is. Now, in the past, you're seeing all these little marching ants around the individual strands of hair. That might have just grabbed a group of the hair before. Like, it just it wouldn't know to even think about do, doing the, um, the, uh, the individual strands of hair in the past. Now, it still missed some, too. Like, it didn't grab all the edges here, and that's where Selected Mask comes in. So, if I go to my Select menu and I come down to Selected Mask... Um, I've got it showing me uh, on my view. You can choose which view you want. You can choose an onion skin. You can choose an overlay. You can choose all these different views to kind of show you what is it really doing, what's it not doing, so forth and so on. So maybe I want to see it on white. And also, um, and this is, this is the big difference. Let me show the mask. That mask is amazing compared to the mask I would have gotten a year ago because it would just would have there would have been no individual strands of hair. It just would have been big clobs of selection. So the just select subject. I didn't do anything extra yet. It's already done an amazing job. Now, but it's not perfect because we can still see little strands of blue. We can still see some of the spot that got missed here. We still see some of this other area. Now I said there was one little nuance that also got added recently and that is this area right here. In the refine mode, this is all new. 
Um, refined mode, now there's, well, first of all, now there is a refined mode <laughs> and there's a choice. Uh, color aware. So if you think your background is easily, easily distinguished by color, which mine is, it's a teal background, pretty easy to distinguish that teal color. Or object aware, where um, it's based on the object more so than the color, because maybe it's a white object on a kind of a white background, so the color won't matter as much, but the object has very distinct lines. So you can switch between the refined modes and it will guess which one it thinks uh, best cut choice for simple colors, uh, best choice for hair or, or, or fur on a complex background. So since my background is not complex, I'm gonna stick with color, but just know you now have that choice. Now, what's that refine mode for? It's for using the refine brush. But here's the, here's the best part. Before I, no, normally I would just start brushing like right away. Like I would just say, okay, now I got to brush out all that teal color out of her hair. But because Select Subject did such a good job, I'm going to do, I'm just going to turn on decontaminate colors first. And then I'll only have to brush anything that's not captured by that. So what's decontaminate colors? This thing down here at the bottom which was originally designed for, for example, I am technically sitting on a green screen right now. And depending on the lighting, that green could be reflected in the edges of my shirt or in my hair. So decontaminate means decontaminate that background color out of your subject. So we see little strands of teal reflected in her hair. Well, maybe if I just do decontaminate colors, that might do most of my work for me. Let's try it. And it did. It didn't do it all, but it got a big piece of it that I would have spent time brushing that I don't have to brush anymore. Now, I still see some right in here where it was like, uh, uh, you know, it couldn't select inside the subject here. And I still see a piece that looks weird right here. But for the most part, it did, uh, <coughs> it did, uh, uh, Tim's always cracking jokes. It did a good job uh, making that selection for me. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and now I've, now that I've gotten most of the work done, I'm, I am going to go into the refined edge brush, which I'm already on. And I'm going to start on where the background used to be and paint in. Now it looks like it, it brought that blue back or that teal back. It's just showing me a quick preview of where to brush. And then when I let go, it'll recalculate for me. All right, and I go out over here, get some edges, but let's let go, let it recalculate. And there it is. So it got all that out. Now over here, where it just looks kind of like it missed a spot here. Let's just go ahead and just paint that out or brush that out, I should say, and let go. All right, and that's my that's my background cutout in a matter of seconds with the new portrait select subject as opposed to minutes. And again, a tip for photographers, if you needed to cut out or remove a background, there's just no way you're going to do that in Lightroom. It's just it's not a feature of Lightroom. It's just not possible. Now, the other thing that you're going to get into once you start doing compositing, so this is just another bonus tip is that once I click OK, OK, it did, did an amazing job cutting out the background and it made it onto its own layer non-destructively. So I still have the original. I have the new layer with the mask. I can hold down the, uh, uh, the letter X. I'm sorry. I can hold down. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry. I can hold down, there we go. Hold down my Option or Alt key to see that mask that it cut out. I can hold down the Shift key to see what it did. And, uh, and, and that's what it gave me. So that's the mask that it made based on um, that select subject and selected mask. All right, so now what I wanna do is I want to, um, even though I cut her out, I wanna make sure the background still, or no, I'm sorry, not the background, the foreground, her looks more like she would have been against that scene. The lighting of her is totally different than that scene because she was photographed probably in a studio against that blue teal color. Uh, if you had similar colors on the select subject, and what if you had similar colors with the subject and the background? Remember I showed that button that says make it object-based as opposed to color-based. 
So that would be for where it would, on a complex background, because complex means also that the subject's on the same kind of background, the same color as the background. So in that case, I would have switched to more of an object selection as opposed to a color selection. So if the colors are the same, then that's, that's it. All right, so next up, um, the colors are not the same in this case, where she's now on this background where she looks like she's nicely lit in the studio and the background's, of course, sunset, sunrise. I can't tell, but I think it's sunset. And um, let's go ahead and, and fix that. So I'm gonna go to her image and I'm going to hold down my command key and click on that mask. When I hold down my command key or control key on Windows and click on that mask, it makes a selection of the mask, but I don't wanna select her, she's already selected. I wanna now go to the background with that selection in place and duplicate that, that silhouette of the background. So command J, PC control J, which simply says, Make a, make a duplicate layer of what's selected. So what I just selected was just the, the shape of her, her mask on the background all by itself. Now I'm gonna move that layer that I just cut out on top of her. So now we see that mask on top of her and I'm going to do two things. I'm going to, um, first of all, average all those colors on that layer. So let's go to filter, let's go to um, blur, and let's choose average. So take all those colors, the, the, the oranges, the white, the dark colors, and just average them into one color. And that's the one color of the average of colors there. Simple enough. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to then set my blend mode to color because I want the blend mode to colorize her into that average. Now, at 100%, that's way too much because it's just making her look almost sepia tone or black and white. But now I'm just gonna go ahead and drop down the opacity of that down to let's say around, I usually start at around 35%. 35%, and again, this is the before where she's too bright, too orange, too toned down to a more dull color to match that background. Now, someone said, hey, you could blur out the background too to kind of create like a depth of field and you could absolutely do that as well using a filter on the background. Uh, but that's, and, and again, if you thought the toning down wasn't enough, you could increase the opacity to kind of tone her down, tone her colors down some more. Or if you thought it was too much, you could decrease the opacity to kind of bring back out some of that color. But just to, just to keep in mind, that's another way to kind of make it match or kind of make it look like she was against that background at the time. Okay, so that was select subject, and that was um, removing a background, and that was select and mask, and that was the new modes in select and mask for uh, color refinement or object-based refinement. And then you've got, um, of course, the ability just to do a quick tip with averaging the color of the background on top of her and blending it in to kind of make her look more like she was against that background when it was photographed. Okay, let's go ahead, and uh, I'm just gonna close out of this. Uh, can you speak on adjusting opacity versus fill? Sure. Um, opacity, think of it this way. Think of it, let's say you had a, a shape of a heart and the heart had red fill with a um, black outline around it. If I lower the opacity of that heart layer, I'm lowering the opacity of everything, the red and the black outline. If I lower the fill, I'm just lowering the red. The black outline wouldn't get adjusted. So that's the difference between opacity versus fill. Okay, now let's go ahead and close this. And she keeps popping up because we're gonna use her in a minute, but we're not gonna use her just yet. Let's go into, let's talk about a little sky replacement. All right. I showed this one, this image before. I don't want to show it again. Let me grab a different one. Let me grab a different one. Not that one. No, not that one. Not that one. Not that one. I could show that one. That would be a good one to show. But I thought I had one earlier that I popped in here just for the sake of this example. Yes, I did. 
Dun, 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 dun. Sorry, guys. I, I had an image that I wanted to show off, but apparently I did not put it in this library. All right. We'll, we'll, um, it's bugging me because I know I put it in this library. <laughs> so I know it's here. I'm pretty sure I did. Give me one more second. Nope, not there. Okay. Let me just open it this way then. There it is. That's the one I want to show. Okay, let's go ahead and open it up. I knew I had it. Now, this image is begging for sky replacement, right? It's just the sky. There is no sky. It's just uh, kind of a, just a white, bluish nothing. Now, the, the last image that I did show before was this one. And I'm going to show you the differences of why I, when I first used this image for Adobe Max, why this made such a great image. So let's just do a quick recap. Sky replacement is a new feature in Photoshop that, uh, again, can't do this in Lightroom. Can't, you know, if you're a photographer and you want to replace skies, this is the place to go. When I go to sky replacement, it's going to, first of all, default to the last sky that I used. And what makes this so amazing is that I didn't touch the, the image up front. It masked out the bridge. It masked out all the suspension ropes. It masked out all the trees. And it, it figured out what the sky was and shows me a preview of what it would look like replaced. And if I don't want to use that sky, I can go in and just pick a different sky. So like, like I can go pick, um, let's go pick that one. And I get that sky. And again, it's doing all that masking, all that upfront work for me and figuring out what the sky is. Now, if I change the time of day, let's say we do a sunrise or sunset, it even starts to affect the foreground and colorizing the foreground for me as well. Now, if you've got a, if you've got a keen eye and you've been looking at this the entire time, or maybe you saw me do it last time, you notice there is one thing that's not changing. So sky replacement doesn't do doesn't do reflections. So if you were doing a shot of a mountain over a lake, the reflection in the lake would still be whatever sky was originally there. And in this case, we've got windows. The windows are still showing the original sky because it doesn't do reflections. However, the Photoshop team did, for the, until, the, until they make it automatically do reflections, they did give you the ability to use a brush, which is right here on the sky replacement panel. You have a sky brush, and you have a mode for that sky brush in the upper left corner here. It's set to overlay 50% by default, and I'm going to change mine to normal just because it'll work faster. But um, now I could go in and I can start brushing... I'm not taking my time to go in the individual window panes by any means because I don't have enough time to do that. But as I brush, I'm now brushing in the sky that's technically behind this building, which is really not the reflection, but it would make it look more realistic. And of course, you would take your time and go in and do a good job of the brushing. I'm not doing a good job of the brushing because I don't have time. But uh, that's how you would fix the reflection in your skies where it did not, um, where you had a reflection. If you didn't have a reflection, you'd be all set. But if you have a reflection that needs to be fixed, they, they do give you a brush for it. And if you want to increase the opacity, you say, you know, 50% is not enough. You can go in and increase it to whatever you need it to be. And uh, away you go. And again, you would take your time, zoom in, you do every pixel and, and get it just right. Okay. Once you're done with this and you click OK, oh, and, and by the way, since we're talking about tips and tricks, so the next thing that you would do is you would, uh, let's say you don't like any of these skies, because when you go into this, you're going to have one or, I think, two or three categories. You're going to have blue skies, spectacular, and sunset. So you're going to have all three of these. These are the ones that come with Photoshop. But if you create your own folder, Terry Skies, and you click the plus sign, and this is this is a downside to this. Unfortunately, you can only go get skies from the operating system. Like you can't bring them in from a library, you can't bring them in from Lightroom. They have to be in a you know on your hard drive somewhere. So I created way back when, uh, when I was first showing this feature, I created a folder of skies. There it is, and I could go in and I could go ahead and start grabbing these skies. Uh, and I think it makes you do them one by one too, which is also a pain in the butt. 
But let's say I go ahead and open up that sky. <clears throat> you can name it. I don't remember what that sky looks like. And there we go. I brought in a sky that looks kind of cool. Not for this image, but it looks kind of cool. And there it is. Um, so you can bring in as many of your own skies as you want. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. Next. Um, so that's the tip for bringing in your own skies. So let's say I go back to the sky we had. I don't remember which one it was. It was probably a sunset. Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember. Maybe it was in Spectacular. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll live with that. Okay, once you click OK, it's going to give you a layer group of all of those things that it did, including your masking. So you, you can go in and you can... Um, you can see where you painted. You can see how badly you painted on the left side there. Uh, just holding down the Option or Alt key and clicking the mask to see it. And, of course, it's a mask, so you can always go back and repaint it properly. But you've got your sky, you've got your group, and you can uh, always turn that group off to get back to the original sky or turn it back on. And when you turn it off and go back to your original background, that means that you can bring up another sky replacement. So you can have multiple sky choices in your Photoshop file until you decide which one you like best. So keep that in mind as well. All right, um, that's cool because you can make it surreal with no uh, with a non-sky imagery as well. Yep, uh, having many skies in your folder, will it slow down Photoshop? No, it will not slow down Photoshop because they're just, it, 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 I mean, it might slow it down a millisecond when it brings the folder up to show them to you, but it's not gonna slow down Photoshop overall because it's not looking at that folder until you bring up sky replacement. All right. Uh, could I host the next illustration? <laughs> 10, 10 brushwork. Uh, this will look good for the with the hair lady in front too. Okay, yep. All right, so um, that was what I wanted to show. Oh, that wasn't what I wanted to finish showing in sky replacement. This is what I want to talk about as well. Now, uh, this was the image I was looking for, and this was the one I want to show with sky replacement. And this, is, this brings illustrates a... Uh, best practice about sky replacement. This image just worked beautifully. I could pick any sky I want and it just works so well. That's not going to always be the case because it's also going to depend on the quality of your image. This image is kind of taken at just a eh, time of day. You know, just the sky, the, 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 it just wasn't that great of a uh, a nature day, like the, the mountains are kind of bluish and there's a haze over them and it's just all kinds of weird stuff going on here. So if I go up and choose sky replacement, it might not look as magical. So let's go see. It'll, it'll do what it's supposed to do, but what I'm saying is you have to be very careful about what you pick. So for example, it picked that. It's doing its job. It did kind of, you know, give me a little orange here in the foreground, but I would have to make sure that I'm really careful about the temperature down here because this was more of a bluish, cooler time of day. And this looks like a nice warm sunrise or sunset. So they don't really match for the person that's really paying attention. Uh, so you might need to go in and you might need to tweak things. So if I go to the temperature and make it bluer, uh, now it's starting to look more realistic, but not totally realistic. If I go warmer, then that's totally way off because it just doesn't match that mountain range. Now, I could always go into the mountain range and adjust that after the fact if I really wanted to use that sky. But just also look at the light on the ground. It just, it's, it's just not the same. So be careful when just because you can pick anything you want doesn't mean you're going to, it's going to work. If you know what I mean? It's, it's just, yeah, it's a beautiful sky. It doesn't just really doesn't do this subject justice. It's, it's, it's just not going to be as good. So let's say I pick uh, kind of a better day sky. Yeah, that could kind of work because the colors match. The, the, it looks more realistic than that, that sunrise sky. Like that I could fall for. That I could say, oh, yeah, that, that was the sky that was there that day. Uh, so just be careful when you're picking skies that they actually, you know, if you're trying to replace the sky, you want it to look realistic. That doesn't look realistic. Uh, you know, this one may or may not. That one looks more realistic. That looks like that could have happened that day. So ask yourself after you pick a sky, um, does it look like that would have been the sky that day? And if the answer is no, can I adjust it? If the answer is no, pick a different sky. So just keep that in mind as well. 
Uh, what tips would you recommend? I just started Photoshop. What you recommend? Uh, good starting points. Uh, good starting projects to do uh, just to get the hang of things. Um, <clears throat> so someone's asking, um, just started Photoshop. What tips would I recommend to you know, starting projects to get a good hang of things? Um, I would say go watch my Getting Started with Photoshop, 10 Things Beginners Want to Know How to Do. I would start there. And I would say Photoshop's mostly about making good selections. If you want to get a good foundation, learn all the selection tools, learn all the different methods of selecting. Because once you get selections under your belt, then it's so much easier to do so many more things. So um, I would start with that video, Photoshop for Getting Started with Photoshop, 10 Things Beginners Want to Know How to Do, and then go from there. All right. Um, okay, next up, let's go in and let's take a look at, uh, da, 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 da. let's go and grab, search my libraries for a car. Okay. So I have this stock image of a car. And again, nicely lit, shot in a, a studio, nicely. I mean, it's just beautiful image of a car. If you wanted to um, add some blurring to the wheels, if you wanted to do things like that, that's again, another one of those things you're just not gonna do effectively in, um, in, in Lightroom, but easy enough to do in Photoshop. So for example, in Photoshop, you've got this uh, blur gallery. So if we go to the blur gallery, you've got field blur, iris blur, tilt shift, path blur, and spin blur. So if we go to spin blur, that gives me a spinny wheel. I can go ahead and, and add it and uh, adjust the size, that's uh, the feather, adjust the size of it. There we go. And there we go. And kind of get it in position around that wheel. Tilt it a little bit. There we go, and bring it in some more because we don't want to. We don't want it to be on the non-wheel part. There we go. And now, I have a little dial in the middle of it to turn it up or down. So if I want to have more blur, I can turn it up. Then I can also see the amount of feather that I gave it was too much. Let's bring that back out, and I can also turn it down if that's way too much. I uh, can turn it way down and give just a slight motion blur in the shape of a spin. Now, um, obviously going to have more than one wheel. So you can go ahead and click in another one and do the same thing. Size it way down and put that on the back wheel as well. So just things like this that are just, like I said, not possible, not a feature of Lightroom are easy to do in products like Photoshop, where I just want to control not only the amount of blur, but where that blur appears. Um, and this is just one of the blur gallery filters. Uh, you notice that they're, they're all in the blur gallery. I started with spin blur, but I could add any one of these as well. So I could say, you know what? I want a path blur as well to make the actual back of the car blurry if the car was actually moving in front of me. Uh, so I could add that path blur and um, get the controls for that. So if I drill down to it, there we go. And then I could move the path of the blur. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to do that. It's adding them and let's still, I'm clicking in the wrong spot there. There we go. And let's make sure we move that one. And again, I got this amount slider so I can turn it down, say not as much, not as much. And I can also say that the path is shorter. So you have all kinds of controls over the amount of blur, where you want the blur to be and what direction you want the blur to go in and how much blur you want along that path. So if I stretch it out, I'm actually expanding uh, the path for that blur and I'm getting that blur more on the back but not so much on the front. And I believe each point, nope, yeah, each point has its own adjustment for the amount as well. 
if I can turn it down in the back or turn it up, yeah, turn it down in the back and turn it almost completely off in the front and kind of get that motion blur in the back around, especially around the mirror, but nice and nice and sharp in the front. We still got the, the wheels in blur and you just create all these nice special effects um, in your still photos that uh, this photographers just love to do this kind of stuff because it, it's, it's not only fun, but it just gives you, it just adds that extra oomph to your images that um, shooting a still car in a studio just wouldn't give you. Uh, now, if you were out on the track, you could do this all in camera, but we're not out on the track, we're in the studio. So we, you know, we add these special effects after the fact. So we click OK, and that becomes our, um, we'll give it a second render, that will become our image. Now, you could have also done this, I didn't do this up front and I normally would, you could have uh, converted this to a smart filter layer first before you apply that blur so that once it applies it, you would always be able to undo it. So for example, I can undo it now, undo blur gallery, but the tip that I would tell everybody is that if your filter allows it, convert for smart filters first, that will convert your background or your layer into a smart object layer, and then you can run that filter that you just ran. Yep, there it is, and I click OK. And now when it renders it, I have a progress bar over here that you're not seeing. There it is. Now when it finishes rendering it, it will be in a, a more non-destructive state. So there it is. So now it's on, on a smart filter layer, and I have the ability to always go back in, double click on Blur Gallery to go back in and tweak the settings or turn something on or off, or just simply turn off the whole thing and get right back to the original car as a non-destructive process. So now I've turned the blur off, completely off, not done, or turn it back on, on, on the wheels, on the back of the car, just fine. So uh, that's why I would always recommend, especially with filters, if you can do a smart filter layer first, then that way you have the ability to change your mind later. So if I save this as a Photoshop file, come back later, that layer's there, I can always go in and tweak it, turn it off, turn it on, without it permanently affecting those pixels. Okay, next up, uh, my list of things here. Uh, even though it doesn't have anything to do with really this particular image, but uh, just, just so you know that you have the ability to, to go in render, and you have a lens flare, because you know, we're photographers, we like lens flares. Uh, lens flare is a really old filter and it's got some limitations. Like for example, the preview window is this small window, so you can't really see it on the canvas until you get done. But you can move this lens, this lens blur around. You can even change what type of lens it is. 35 millimeter um, prime, 105 prime, uh, movie prime. It looks more like um, uh, a Star Trek kind of bl uh, lens blur. You can change the brightness of it. Uh, and you can just kind of put this anywhere you want and the reflections of it will also go wherever there's, wherever you designate that they go based on where you position it. Now, again, this is not the best image for this, but if you needed a night sky with a nice lens blur in it, uh, you can do that as well. Uh, maybe I'll crank it up just so we could really see it. Click OK. And there's my lens blur. Now again, um, or lens flare. I could, oops, sorry, turn that lens flare off and give it a second, it'll render it without it. <laughs> uh, it's funny that I have, to, I have to wait to see it. I, it. It appeared instantly, but now I have to wait to see it without it because it still needs to apply the blur gallery now without the lens flare. And there it is. All right, but if I turn it back on, should happen. There we go. Um, nope, it's got to render. Because now it's rendering two filters together depending on what they would look like based on each other. So that's why I'm getting these progress bars now. But anyway, uh, what I was going to show is once it's back on, you'll not only see the obnoxious lens flare in the upper right corner, but you will see really it's casting that across the whole image. If we look at the bottom here, you can actually see the effects of the lens blur. And a lot of times this is more of what you want than the actual lens flare itself. You, you kind of like those reflections. So that's why I like, I might even move this further off canvas or turn it down more uh, just to kind of create that effect of that lens blur. But you have the idea, you can go in and, and do whatever you want. Uh, it's too saturated for that distance, exactly. So, uh, like I said, not the best subject for this. Um, but you have you have that option. And I, again, turned it up on purpose. All right, next up, 
let's go in and let's close this all that work and we're not going to save any of it let's close this let's close this and since she keeps coming up let me go ahead and jump ahead to this one so um portrait retouching one of my favorite topics and i should do more of that in 2021 but portrait retouching uh involves just again making people look their best which filter will be applied first, the lens blur or lens flare or the blur? Uh, Tim, it's it's actually stacking order, so you can you can change the stacking order of those uh, smart filters as well. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and um, zoom in. And what I wanted to show here was a quick couple of tips about skin. So she has a few temporary blemishes, and the temporary blemishes I don't mind removing because they're temporary. Like. You know, in, in a week or in two months, those those blemishes may not even be there. So why have a photograph of something that is not there permanently? A mole, a beauty mark, something like that that is permanent, you probably want to keep. But things like this that are temporary, you probably want to get rid of. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, duplicate the layer first. And, and, and since we're talking Photoshop, I will go ahead and do that. But if this image came over from Lightroom, chances are I already have the original in Lightroom. I don't need to duplicate the layer just to have a backup. But we'll duplicate the layer just so we can show our before and after. All right, so now we got the, the background copy and we're gonna go ahead and start doing all our retouching on that. I'm gonna switch to my healing brush, uh, spot healing brush that is. And um, the nice thing about the spot healing brush is you can just tap or you can, I'm using a Wacom uh, Cintiq here. So if you see my uh, hands cam, you can see that I'm actually painting right on the screen. So I'm just gonna go ahead and remove those things right out of the image itself there's like a stray hair here i'm just going to just go ahead and paint that stray hair right out of the image and i don't know it looks like a line on her nose I'm just going to do that and just very quickly you can kind of get rid of some of those temporary blemishes and just smooth things out very quickly now a lot of people um, want to get into skin smoothing and i i use i re very rarely use skin smoothing because in most cases, the person doesn't need it. If you, if you remove the blemishes or the things that are making the skin look not smooth, then you've already smoothed the skin. And usually what makes skin not look smooth is things like uh, bad lighting. <laughs> so if there's shadows uh, or if the lighting's uh, ex accentuating the blemishes, then that's gonna make the skin look rougher than it probably really is. All right, same thing, stray hair here. Let's just go ahead and paint that one out. And there we go. All right. So now let's talk about one of the one of the um, one of the most popular skin smoothing techniques is a is a um, it's a technique called um, frequency separation. I don't know why it's called frequency separation. Maybe one of the smart people in the audience will will tell us why. But it's called frequency separation, and there's multiple techniques for this. I'm going to show you a simple one, and I always have to look at my notes because I don't do it every day, and plus I even have an action set up to do it. So even when I do it, I'm not doing it manually. Um, but if you want to get into uh, frequency separation and and um, and this technique, um, it's probably, so you don't have to keep doing it manual, it's probably easier just to go ahead and record it as an action, which I have an action called frequency separation right here. So I, that's, that's the one I normally use. But anyway, um, what it is, is I'm gonna walk you through it. So you're gonna duplicate the layer twice. So we did it, we, we were on this, we're gonna, we're gonna pretend the background doesn't exist. So we're gonna duplicate the layer twice. So Command J, Command J. So now we have three layers. And again, we're, we're pretending the original one doesn't count because it doesn't. We're, we're using that as a, as a before layer. So now you're gonna go to the middle layer and you're gonna apply a Gaussian blur to that layer. So we're gonna to go to filter, and we're gonna to go to blur, and we're gonna to go to Gaussian blur. And uh, the amount, again, will depend a lot on the resolution of your image. So in this one, I'm just gonna do six pixels, so a very small amount of blur. And you don't see it because it's on the middle layer, because the top layer is covering it. But there's the middle layer now, I just turned the top layer off, and so you can see that that middle layer did get a little bit of blur. Now you're gonna click on the top layer and you're gonna to go to your image and you're going to go to uh, apply image. 
And on your apply image, you're going to get a dialog box. And again, I never do this because I have to look at the settings because I never do this often enough to remember them. Uh, you're going to go to layer. You're going to go to your uh, layer one, your, your middle layer, I should say. So that would be my copy two in this case. And you're going to um, blend mode is going to be subtract. And subtract. There we go. Subtract. And then you're going to uh, do your scale is going to be a negative two. I did not. Oh, wait. No, it's not going to be negative two. It's going to be two. <laughs> I've got a dash in front of it. Scale is going to be two. And your offset's going to be 128. And what it's giving you is this kind of grayish outline of your image. All right. I just want to make sure I got everything else. Scale is going to be 128. Click OK. Um, yep, click OK. And then we're going to change our blend mode to uh, linear light. OK. There it is. And dun, 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 dun. click on the middle layer and select an area of skin. OK, there we go. So we're going to select our middle layer. So that, that basically is just applying that sharpness on top of the image because what you what the reason why we're doing this technique is because skin smoothing should not smooth pores like this the skin should still look real after the fact so you shouldn't have it so that the skin is so smooth that it, it looks like a barbie dial this looks like plastic so that's what that that main top layer is its purpose is serving so now we're going to go to the uh, middle layer and this is where you're now going to be selective with your lasso tool. And with your lasso tool, you're just going to go ahead and select areas of skin that you would really want this to apply to. So I'm just going to make a big selection here. And you can hold down your shift key and select other areas. So shift key. Oh, hang on. I got it on my lasso by mistake. There we go. Shift key. And there. And maybe here as well. All right, so now we got those areas selected, and of course you would pick and choose your areas. Uh, we're going to feather that by 15 pixels, again, so it's not a hard edge selection. And we're just going to go to Modify, Feather, 15, and then you're going to apply Gaussian Blur. This one's going to be a bigger Gaussian Blur. Filter, uh, Blur, Gaussian Blur, and we're going to do 24. All right. And again, the amount will depend on you. But if you think 24 is too much, then you would make it less. But what that will do, and you can and you can see the areas where I didn't select. So I didn't select that area, but I did select this area. So this area got nice and smooth, but we still see texture. And again, if you thought it was too smooth, then you would just do less than 24. But you can see the areas around the nose that I didn't apply this to. You can see this area down here on the chin next to the area where I did it. So we get nice smooth skin, but we still have texture. And that's the whole point of doing, um, of doing the um, frequency separation technique. And you can really see the difference too, because I didn't apply it on her neck. So you can see like the difference of skin texture there versus there. But the main thing is you still want to see texture on your image. If you're not seeing texture on your image, then that means that... Um, you've gone too far. <laughs> you, you blurred away the details in the skin and that's what you don't want. All right. I've, I got like a minute left and let's see what kind of, what tip can I give you in a minute? Uh, dun, 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 dun. uh yeah, let's, um, let's just go up here real quick, uh, really quick. So a lot of times, you know, you need to smooth out eyebrows. I've shown this tip before, but really quickly we'll grab uh, our lasso tool. I don't really have a minute. Actually, you know what? Never mind. <laughs> I'm out of time because I don't want to get in the middle of the technique and then get cut off and then have to finish it next week. So we'll just do that that tip next another time. All right. So with that said, um, thanks for joining me for my Photoshop tips and techniques for photographers. There's always so much more to show than I have time for. And hopefully you got something out of this. You can always go back and rewatch it. And again, if you're just getting started in Photoshop, 
Um, go ahead and watch some of the previous Photoshop sessions in the Masterclass series uh, that I've done, as well as on my own channel. I've got uh, terrywhite.tv. I've got a how to get started with Photoshop for beginners, um, 10 things beginners want to know how to do. So if you're a beginner, uh, you probably should go watch that as well. All right, next up is the uh, Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge. And then after that, more master classes from all my colleagues here at Adobe. So cheers, everybody. All my fellow evangelists uh, are going to be up next. And uh, with that said, have a great day. Have a great weekend. Three-day weekend for me. So yay. Cheers, everybody. Have a good one.